the talk I want to give today, again, is I kind of already highlighted what's on, on this, but I'm going to share these slides later. So if people want the abstract for it, uh, here it is. But really what I'm focused on here is the question of the exponential growth and the volume, velocity, and variability of all this data we have access to when it comes to structured and unstructured social media data. And in social media data, I include a lot of different categories of information. Certainly what we see flowing across, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Reddit and YouTube, but also places like RSS feeds and how people are getting their news kind of, again, sent to them with updates. Um, and so with all of this kind of environment, the question that provoked some of this work is, how can scientists best use computational tools to analyze these data with the goal of understanding not just individuals, but how individuals interact within broader social systems? And what I want to share with you today, again, is some is very much at the individual level and trying to intervene and help individuals, but even then it's within systems of support. But more generally, when we think of social media, we think about it happening, again, in terms of broader interactions within social systems, the broader social networks, uh, especially when we talk about things like discourses around political controversies. And so really what we're talking about here is an unprecedented opportunity to view expression, actions, connections, contagion, imitation, and in some respects, it's awfully tempting to look at all of this without much regard for you know, uh, uh, what we're peering into or, or how exactly we're going about doing that. But I think we have to be deeply, deeply concerned when we're accessing and use these kinds of data with issues of data privacy. Um, I think we've seen examples uh, of people like uh, uh, Jeff Hancock and others have gotten in, 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 in situations where people have gotten very uh, upset about this with, you know, manipulation without what some might call fully informed consent, uh, uh, people agreeing in advance to uh, uh, terms of service that include opportunities for experimental manipulation, but then not uh, uh, necessarily feeling that they were appropriately approached or certainly debriefed about the fact they were involved in experimental studies. Um, we also see issues with deep harvesting of user profile data, everything from the Facebook uh, uh, controversy with Cambridge Analytica on forward. And many of these are issues with data not being sufficiently aggregated to avoid identification and a big move within efforts to share data, including you know, unstructured data or structured data uh, for data replication purposes has been this very struggle about how we maintain data privacy within these contexts. The other issue that I think we have to address whenever we talk about these kinds of data is major issues with data representativeness, right? We, we have, you know, the stratified nature of social media data in terms of who uses social media. Not everyone is a social media user. In fact, it's a very specific subgroup of people, especially the people who are outspoken on social media. So it's not, it's a barometer, but it's not necessarily a, a, a very representative uh, uh, reflection. And so the work I want to talk to you about today really is, at its core, what I would term computational communication science. And uh, uh, in 2015, I worked with uh, Joe Capella and Russ Newman uh, uh, to edit a volume of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science uh, uh, that was really trying to collect what we thought was cutting edge computational communication science research. And that work was really data that used various collection and analytic techniques, often with very large complex databases. Though I think, again, I dislike the term big data because I don't necessarily think they have to be that large necessarily, right? That really it involves computing variables from trace data, available digital, mobile, and social media data, and then using machine or algorithmic solutions to generate patterns and inferences from these data. And so I'm going to avoid the term big data in this talk. Instead, I'll talk about computational communication science or computational social science. And again, that's the term that, that Joe and Russ and I landed on in 2015. And I think uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that we did because, again, more and more of what I'm seeing is 
Lots of mixed methods work, work that oftentimes is not huge in scale and shouldn't intimidate us in terms of having to collect huge volumes of data or having huge repositories. Um, many of the tools that I'm going to talk about or even the data sets that you could have access to if you'd like to learn more about these data are data that can live on a laptop, right? Uh, uh, and that you could collect with uh, uh, fairly easy uh, uh, resources. So really what we're talking about is computational analysis of digital trace data, uh, uh, social media expression interaction, social network ties and community membership, geolocation and sensor data that provide these traces. And all of these provide the potential for multi-method triangulation in combination with experiment surveys, dissemination studies, clinical trials. I'm not saying computational analysis should replace other forms of social science research. In fact, I think it is one of many tools in our arsenal of doing research. And in fact, you know, uh, 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 any student who's worked with me knows that, you know, I use a range of methods and, and oftentimes in combination, uh, oftentimes even in a single study. And that's purposeful because I think it allows us to tri triangulate on these questions. So, where I want to start today in terms of taking this kind of approach of computational communication science and thinking about social media, particularly as a lens for understanding um, the human condition, if you will, our, uh, 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 our health and democratic crises, more specifically, and the opioid epidemic, epidemic and, and, and the mass shooting epidemic in the US specifically, um, is really to start with social networking sites and health support. And here the work I've been doing um, in this area, which uh, you know, I think <laughs> in the introduction, the, the, the grant dollars associated with the work I've done was mentioned. And you know, most of that has been uh, uh, you know, in association with health communication research because it's widely funded and, and is solutions and interventions based, right? And so oftentimes it can be you know, uh, uh, used to actually hopefully help or intervene. And, and in this case, it was about how can communication technology help with chronic care? Um, how can it address things like cancer care? How can it address uh, aging populations, uh, people with multiple chronic conditions, people with AIDS, HIV? Um, so these were all questions that precipitated the broader work we we're doing. But really the work that I want to talk about today is around the opioid epidemic, which again, 80,000 deaths, 88,000 deaths per year that have been going up. Uh, um, uh, excuse me, this is the, uh, uh, the drinking epidemic. I'm going to uh, 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 talk about this and I'm going to return to this, but the, the, the work that we did on opioids started with talking about uh, and working on uh, alcohol abuse, um, which is again, uh, uh, quarter of a trillion dollars in, in lost economic costs, massive chronic conditions in terms of cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, risky sexual behaviors, you know, uh, uh, and, and including uh, uh, sexual assault and aggression, but also unintended pregnancies and miscarriage. Um, and then uh, again, violence, injuries, and other kinds of secondary victims because of things like vehicle crashes. crashes. Add to that now the opioid epidemic, right? Another you know, uh, 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 70,000 people died uh, from drug overdoses in 2019. That number went up in 2020 and 2021 with COVID. Uh, uh, you know, 1.6 million with an opioid use disorder. Um, seven, 750,000 people used heroin in the past year. I mean, these are massive numbers with a huge toll and a huge cost. And the, the reason the federal government funds this work is because the toll that it takes on society is so massive, right? And so the work that we've been doing within CHESS, which is a Center for Health Enhancement System Studies, has been about building suites of tools to help support people in chronic care conditions. So my work with CHESS began over a dozen years ago, and it began around work around cancer communication and cancer support and creating tools and systems to support women with breast cancer, people recovering from colon cancer, the caregivers of lung cancer patients who were terminal, and really to create, again, information resources, communication 
systems that could create lateral support and then different tools that could help these different people. We did the same thing with aging populations and did this by creating a system called Elder Tree. Most recently, we've been building tools to address the question of addiction treatment. And that has been the suite of tools called HS. And again, it's a, again an integrated suite of tools, uh, 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 information resources. So, uh, uh, you know, where are meetings located? Uh, uh, what is recovery information? Uh, podcasts that contain uh, uh, relevant content. Um, but then also communication systems, uh, uh, panic buttons that can connect you immediately with uh, 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 resources, uh, uh, a way to click directly to your support team or go to group discussions. And again, uh, 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 a team feed that you can see what's being updated. But then also tools like tools for easing distress or uh, 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 that can be used essentially as people feel an urge. Um, or a panic button, again, that can be used to connect you with individuals if the need arises. This work, again, has been funded by a series of studies that are completed, and the ones in blue are completed, and we've got existing data for those, for those who might be interested in learning more about how uh, you might gain access to this or work with us, there's processes of applying through IRB uh, for access to these data. And then we have a number of studies that are currently in the field. And I'm gonna talk about studies from both of these sets uh, uh, over the course of our time together. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the work started really around the alcohol use disorders problem. Lifetime prevalence in the US is about a third of adults, 18 years and older will have an alcohol use disorder issue. Serious and long-term risks are again, I already kind of hit, hit at these, you know, a, a quarter of a billion dollar problem with so many different uh, uh, potential uh, uh, victims of the broader injuries and violence that can result from this. And then also the toll it takes on chronic health and early death. Third leading preventable cause of death in the US and relapse is extraordinarily common. About 50% of individuals will turn to problem drinking within a year of treatment. Well, we created this system HS and when we implemented it, we conducted a clinical trial to compare it to those who were in our control condition, people who were given a phone, but not given access to the HS system. So they were given technology, but they weren't given the support system and all the tools associated with it. And what we found was, in fact, this is, uh, again, a, a number of risky drinking days. Uh, 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 and uh, this is, again, comparing all cases and completed cases in both cases, a uh, 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 high, highly significant difference and, and sizable effect size difference. Um, this is comparing it at eight weeks, 12 weeks, and looking overall at, at four, eight, and 12 weeks. And again, seeing significant differences uh, in terms of the uh, abstinence at these extended periods. The system works. Now, that's great. We can deploy the system and use the system, and it's now been implemented, and it's, there's tens of thousands of people using the system. We've given it away free to the Veterans Administration. We've uh, made it available to relapse prevention centers across the country. But our question has now shifted to a, a deeper question, which is, can we use the data we collect through this system for people who have consented and people who are interested in us doing this with them for relapse prediction. Can we use their day-to-day -day input of the system to have a sense as to when someone is likely to experience the stressors that are gonna either require them to need recovery support? And so the idea here is data is being collected passively as user, users interact with the mobile system and this can reveal the risk of relapse by allowing us to use certain kinds of predictive modeling or intervention techniques. It's really treating the smartphone as a giant sensor or collector of data. And again, I wanna be very clear, this is done with the full consent of the subjects to the degree to which what we do is when we consent them into a study, we actually ask them what kinds of data they wanna share and they're compensated based on which data they agree to share. If they find some kind of data they don't want to share, they can shut that data access off. 
And so this is again, completely up to them. It does not delimit their access to the support services. It's really about how much data they wanna share with us in terms of their system use. The idea here is that the, this could allow tailoring of services to intervene prior to relapse. So, you know, we could look to for content appropriate for stable or unstable recovery trajectories. We could have counselors contact or other interventions for those people who are at higher risk. And this is again about directing resources to an overstressed system where people who are in dire need of care and support aren't receiving it in a timely manner. So the tool that we've been using at the center of our ability to potentially tap into um, the likelihood of uh, experiencing um, stressors or problems that would lead to relapse is natural language processing. And again, there's a robust body of work that language is a great lens through which to understand people's psychological processes relevant to health and behavior, what people say, what they express, what they share with us, what they articulate, how they choose to articulate it, all can be very, very insightful about their psychological state. And there's lots of things that people will reveal very unconsciously that, that give us a sense as to how they're thinking as I'll discuss in, in a moment. And these language processing models, I think have a number of advantages. One is that they're efficient. We can process vast amounts of data. So when people use a system like chess, we might impanel for a clinical trial, 400 people to use our system. Those people might exchange 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 messages over the course of their use of the system over six months or 12 months. And so again, we could try to hand code it. We have in the past tried to hand code. It's an enormous task. Um, but the advantage again of the efficiency of processing it, and again, reliability, consistent coding, absent kind of clear biases. Now I wanna say absent all biases because any system has certain biases and we can discuss that too, uh, uh, hopefully during the Q and A. And then the other thing is, is sensitivity, and that is coders' unawareness of certain language use. So I'm going to give an example, which is, you know, use of singular or plural pronouns. Hard for coders to notice how many of those are being used unless you're being really, really careful about knowing that. But machines can code that really easily. Are you talking about just yourself and your state, or are you talking about how you are with others? It can be very indicative, potentially. And so here, what we're doing is coding for concept devised or derived language categories that we think are meaningful. So we've taken theoretically kind of inspired coding approaches to looking at and saying, well, what might be a good indicator of someone on a positive recovery trajectory? Well, gratitude expression. What might be a, 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 a one that isn't so good? Uh, well, it might be expressions of anger or distress. It might be expressions of negative affect. So we're building models specifically with those kinds of characteristics in mind. And typically, I'm just gonna give one example here. This is a piece we published in Health Communication. Um, the person who's been behind a lot of this research is Rachel Cornfield, who's now at Northwestern University. Amazing young scholar, K award winner, uh, just again, uh, off the charts in terms of doing health informatics research. Uh, 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 write down her name because she is uh, 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 going to be and already is an important voice in this area. Um, in, in the case of some of the work we did together, we took Luke, which is a very you know, simple way of coding language, but we used Luke, Luke features in combination with uh, um, existing uh, hand coding that we'd done to build machine learning classifiers using Luke features. And we did this for the period of the four months before the survey to tabulate, again, how much of this kind of language was being generated. We also had action log data from within the system. So this is, again, a system we created and controlled. So since we impaneled people, we had every click and keystroke. Every bit of the use of the system is logged on our servers because this is a system 
we've installed on their phones. And when they, the, the phones download the information, they download them to our, our, our server systems. So we could look at the number of messages sent, the nature of the messages sent, who read the messages, how many days the system was used, different features of the system use. And then we also had surveys that were conducted at, at four, eight, and 12 months for things like risky drinking. And this would be alongside baseline measurement of a whole host of control factors. And so how did, our, how did we do with a language-based model? Well, we, we perceive, this is about weekly accuracy in predicting relapse. 81% accuracy, I'm sorry, this is not weekly. This is overall accuracy in predicting relapse over the course of the study. So can we predict relapse at four months? And 81%, 81.7% accuracy, 45% of variance in relapse prediction. And this is above baseline characteristics that did not do a particularly effective job at at predicting relapse, right? People's age, people past relapse history, things like that. Linguistic features accounted for the most variance. And what accounted for it? Things like impulsivity or negativity, swearing. People who swore, increased risk of relapse. Negative emotion words, increased risk, risk of relapse. On the other hand, cognitive uh, uh, surfacing. When people were talking about how they were thinking and feeling, reflecting, that reduced their risk. On the other hand, when they talk about inhibition words, urges, right? F feelings of, you know, what I wanna do, that increased their risk. Personal, uh, personal reflection, achievement words, and death words, reduced risk. Achievement words, you know, marking how many days they'd stayed sober and the, the affirmations they'd receive. But the death words were oftentimes reflection on friends who had died. And, and, and about the risk of their own death or mortality, all of which reduce risk. What we did next is try to build a real-time intervention prediction. So this was again at the weekly level to predict the likelihood that we could not overall over a four-month course, because that's too slow, right? Just because I can predict who's likely to relapse you know, at the end of a study, that's not very good. What I really want to be able to do is predict whether someone's going to relapse on a weekly basis or ideally on a daily basis or an hourly basis, right? So here we took some of that same coding, but we subjected it to supervised machine learning classifiers using support vector machines, decision trees, and boosted decision trees to take these ideas and to sort them into whether or not people were talking about having recovery problems or not having recovery problems with the idea that recovery problems would be a flag before they would relapse, right? So it's not predicting relapse, it's predicting that they're having a problem that would likely lead to relapse. What do we find here? We were able to get to 88% sensitivity, 92% specificity in terms of separate cohorts of patients. And we could use this to flag the daily basis of real-time recovery support need. And we actually built this into our system where if people had recovery problems, we would then you know, uh, 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 get them in touch with one of our managers who would reach out to them to see how they were doing, which we think was a, 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 an important innovation. The next step in this process is really adding a whole host of other potential features that we could use to build and generalize these kinds of real-time intervention models. So things like voice stress markers or ecological momentary check-ins, check uh, sorry, ecological momentary assessment check-ins, contextualized call and text logs or GPS tagging uh, uh, for use as signal in machine learning models. And this, this piece was published in, in Journal of Medical Internet Research. Uh, um, again, Rachel Cornfield was the key person behind this. So, what we've done since then is now move to formally trying to build lapse prediction models based on not just what people are saying, but who are they talking to? Where are they going? Who are they spending time with? And what is their daily mood? Now, again, how can we do this? Well, because we ask them if they would consent to us seeing the content of their test messages. 
the network of their communication partners and then providing us some information about who those communication partners are. If they would allow us to look at their geolocation and, and Bluetooth logs, and then if they're willing to indicate where do they go and who do they meet with and to do video check-ins. Again, these are people who are trying to get sober. They're motivated to share information with us. They consent into it. This is not being done you know, behind some veiled system. Instead, the consent process is not just clear, it's oftentimes repeated to make it absolutely clear to them what exactly they're agreeing to do. The reason they agree is again, because their motivation is quite high. Um, the goal here ultimately is, can we use all these features together to predict daily risk likelihood and then figure out how to intervene? So this is the piece that we've just published that lays out our protocol for doing this project. It's in JMIR uh, um, and it's uh, essentially a protocol for this study for those who are interested in the kind of underlying aspects of these different uh, uh, systems and tools. Here's what we're trying to do. Um, to do dynamic factors for predicting lapse, we need, there's things like degree of engagement with treatment, exposure to use related cues in your surroundings, like are you seeing people using changes in wellness, including stress, cravings, mood. So people are at lower risk when they're attending support groups, taking medications. They're at higher risk when they see people and visit places associated with past use or experience pain or life stressors or have strong cravings. So our goal now is certainly to use language, but to use any other signal that we can collect as unobtrusively as possible from the phone to feed into machine learning multimodal models to predict the likelihood of daily risk. And so what we're doing here is, again, personal sensing, leveraging the sensing technology of smartphones, wearable devices, social medias, computers, whatever we have to capture information longitudinally about people's naturalistic environments, their behaviors, their social interactions, their thoughts, their emotions, their moods. Some of this is active. It requires people to take actions and provide measurement, including some self-report. So we do do some ecological momentary assessment. You might get a text saying, okay, who are you with right now? Or where are you right now? Can you fill out this brief survey about your current mood state or who you're in contact with? Or you might get asked to do an audio or video check-in. Well, why would we do that? Because we can use audio to look at stressors in your voice or video to look at your facial emotional register. Do you look like you're in a good mood or in a bad mood? But much of this can be done passively, right? We can measure it with little burden pace on the individual. For example, software, just measuring things like the software, the, the, the smartphones, call logs and geolocation. And, and Things like changes in social contacts or daily movement can then be essentially passively uh, uh, logged once you have basic information. When we think about collecting lapse uh, risk predictors, things like EMA of people's substance use histories, tendencies related to risk, and changes in craving, affect, and stressful events are critical. Geolocation. Data can capture the frequency and duration of visits to places that indicate lapse risk. In fact, we've created red box locations in the past where people have told us where they score drugs or where they would drink. We would red box those locations. If they geolocated to those locations, we could play them a, a video that they'd chosen or sent them a text message urging them not to go to that location. Phone logs and text message logs can capture the number and pattern of communication with family and friends. Now we can also add to that small surveys. If you call someone three times, if you visit a location three times, we might capture some information about that. Who is this individual? Do they support your recovery? Is there drinks or drugs available at this location? These are the kinds of questions we can ask. And people are frankly quite honest about giving information because our risk prediction relies on it and it's actually quite accurate. Um, the content of people's text messages can indicate their moods, stress, cravings, we've relied on those already. And then how long people are using chess features can indicate their motivation, commitment, and engagement and recovery. We just recently published a study uh, that looks at those very factors too, their patterns of system use 
intense patterns of system use tend to indicate that they are under distress and are likely to relapse. We can also have to derive certain risk, risk predictors. And so these are things like uh, the frequency, timing and duration of geolocation or contact loss can be enhanced with things like self-reported contextual information about the relationship of that person or what is that location, describing it, explaining what's available there, right? Critically, contextual information about important people and places can be collected with relatively little burden because people tend to go to the same places again and again. They tend to talk to the same people again and again. Once you collect that information initially, you'll have that information many, many times. I'm just making sure there's no specific comments here. Uh, um, okay. Um, so with that, If we're trying to model lapse risk predictors, we need models that support many predictors and complex data generation to achieve accuracy needed for clim clinical implementation. We need to make sure that we're able to generalize these across different contexts and settings. So we're trying to build these models across a much wider range of people rather than in a single clinical setting, instead trying to recruit people nationally for our most recent studies. And we need to adopt machine learning approaches developed to achieve these goals. And again, you know, we'll use features like predictors derived from either actively or passively to build these models. And we're in the process of doing this now. We've already published a number of pieces. So for those interested, uh, at the end of the talk, I have a list of uh, uh, the pieces that we have on this topic. Um, and so uh, I think, okay, so... The, the, what I want to switch to next is talking about a, a different set of projects that's been funded by a different set of sources. And some of it came from a grant that actually was with Wasan Zhou at Yonsei University and uh, was a uh, social science career grant that supported some of our initial work, a Hewlett Foundation grant. And then we've had two recent grants, one from the Knight Foundation and one from NSF that have been broadly supportive of the work we've been doing around uh, social media data collection, uh, but also news media archiving and data collection. And so really the, the shift I want to talk about next is one from, again, small to large networks. So I just talked about small networks for health support, and they are clearly an essential part of it is a need to establish trust among users, deeper, longer ties require time to form. And that's really ideal for social support and social capital. And and again, as I mentioned, the, those groups bond and, and share and send many messages to each other. There's a, an element of honesty that happens within those groups that people bond in a way that's actually quite remarkable and really do try to support each other's sobriety or health in various ways. When we shift to talking about large networks, really we're talking about networks often as the public square. I don't know how well that analogy works uh, because the public square square seems to be more and more of a brawl. Um, I think there's many networks of networks, many online communities. And we've had students like Yanni Zhang, who's gonna be very essential to a number of the studies I'm presenting next, um, who's you know uh, uh, studied those questions with people like Carl Rowe and looked at different online communities specifically. Really what we have when we talk about large scale social networks is constant activity expression, but also lots of contention and polarization. And so it allows us to attend to both micro, but more importantly, macro dynamics. And so really, I wanna shift from talking about those smaller networks to these larger networks through the lens of this second problem that I mentioned, the second epidemic, oftentimes at the center of American life, and that is mass shootings. And you know, again, this is just a, a map from 20, 1982 forward 2016 doesn't include some of the most recent and most deadly mass shootings that we've experienced, including Las Vegas or the most recent one in, uh, in Texas. Um, but it does include ones like the Newtown uh, school shooting or Fort Hood or you know uh, San Bernardino. And so if you notice just from this chart, the volume, the number, the deadliness of shootings has certainly increased over the last decade or two. And it doesn't show any signs of slowing down, even with this very 
week gun bill that was recently uh, approved by the Senate and the House and will go to President Biden to sign. Um, the public response to mass shootings is curious. Um, reporting the response to mass shootings and the outpouring of grief following is followed by a you know, contention over gun policy. So we see lots of reporting, we see lots of thoughts and prayers, and then we see a debate over gun policy. And we wanted to examine this dynamic as a window into the, the nature of mourning in response to tragedy, right? So one of the questions we're asking is when we look at mass shootings, whose lives are worth mourning? You know, does it take a certain number of victims before social media really responds? Do we grieve for certain kinds of victims more than others? Do we grieve for children more? Do we grieve for particular races more? What does this tell us about the deeper dynamics of American politics, as we can see, not from the kind of microscopic look we can look at when we impanel people in, a, in these panels and can look at things very closely like we can in these NIH studies, addiction treatment, but this is very much in the aggregate, right? We're looking at this in the mass. And partly it gives us also the possibility to, to, you know, to look at deliberation on issues of public interest, right? Is there evidence of a discursive or a more pol polarized public sphere, right? Does the race of the victims or the shooter shape the policy discourse? And, and what spurs discourse on gun rights and gun control? And these are the questions that really motivated this second project. And again, as I mentioned, the, the chief architect of this project is Zini Zhang, who's now a professor at University of Buffalo. Again, just an amazing scholar. The other person who's been quite involved with her on much of this work is both Joe Lukito, who's at Texas Austin, and Ji Yun Suk, who's uh, at University of Connecticut now, both assistant professors at those two schools. So again, as I'll show you at the end of this talk, this is not just my work, but the work of many other people as well. Um, for this project, we really have a very massive data collection. So we have the mass shootings themselves and mass shootings in this project was defined as any shooting that had four or more victims, um, uh, uh, four or more, I should say victims, meaning people killed. Um, but we also looked at social media and news media discourse. In the broader project, we're also looking at things like the stock value of gun companies things like weekly gun sales and proposed gun legislation. So that's part of the broader project. We haven't <laughs> finished that other modeling yet. So I'm gonna share with you the front half of this, which is first presented in the Journal of Computer Media and Communication. And we just had a more recent piece published in International Journal of Press Politics. Um, the features of this is really looking at mass shooting events from 2014 to 20, excuse me, 2012 to 2014. Uh, a total of 60 different events across those three years, including the Aurora Theater shooting, the Sandy Hook shooting, the Navy Yard shooting, and the Fort Hood shooting, which are, again, quite large-scale shootings in the U.S. For each one, we coded uh, um, the total number of victims, the total number of children killed, the number of African Americans killed, the race of the shooter, and the shooting type, whether it was a public shooting, whether it was a school shooting, uh, 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 other such features. For Twitter discourse, we had a 10% sample of Twitter's global stream of tweets from 2012 to 2014. So this was part of an archive we've maintained at Wisconsin from 2012 to 2015. We were collecting 10% of global Twitter. So we still have that. From 2015 on, we were cut to 1%. And since the start of COVID, we've been collecting the COVID endpoint, which is 100% of COVID-related tweets, especially for sanctioned terms. Um, for this particular keywords, we pulled gun, shooter, shooting, firearm, NRA. Initial <laughs> pull was 75 million tweets from our content, partly because you know shoot or shooting is mentioned for every hockey tweet or every basketball tweet. Uh, gun is mentioned in lots of international contexts as are firearms. Um, when we cleaned the data, we was re re reduced to 4.8 million uh, and we classified 1.6 million formally uh, uh, into three different discourses, thoughts and prayers, gun policy or second amendment discourse. We did that using two different techniques, using machine learning 
for text classification training machine learning classifier that was not dependent on hashtags. And separately, we did just hashtag clustering for tweet counts, a much simpler and faster, but arguably less accurate or specific method. So this was also an opportunity for us to compare those two methods. We also looked at news attention to mass shootings from that same period. Here we had the RSS feed of all news stories from six major news outlets that covered either gun violence, gun control, or gun rights. Um, for gun uh, violence, we had terms like mass shooting and gun violence. For gun rights, Second Amendment, gun rights, NRA. For gun uh, control, we had terms like gun control, gun laws, background check. Um, our progressive sources were the Times and the Post, CNN and the, New York, the Chicago Tribune for moderate sources, and the New York Post and Fox News for conservative sources. I just wanna show you quickly the kind of volume of discourse. Part of this is to illustrate how ephemeral public attention is. So this is the Aurora Theater shooting. You can see the spike reaches this level in terms of thoughts and prayers. There's some attention afterwards to, you know, uh, this is the gun control layer here. This is the new town. This is the shooting at the school that resulted in 20 children being killed. Uh, uh, very similar to the Uvidale shooting that we just experienced. Again, a very quick burst of thoughts and prayers, some more extended discourse about gun control in that case, though lots of counter about gun rights and then a strong boost in gun rights discourse after efforts to legislate guns failed in the Senate. Uh, but you can see again how sporadic it is and how quickly it declines after these different episodes. If you look at news coverage, you see a very similar pattern that in fact, you know, after the rise of these events, you'll see a pattern of discourse. It was particularly marked after Newtown, but in most cases, it ebbs and declines quite quickly. But here's what's really fascinating. If we do ARIMA modeling, and one of the things that we published on recently is the need to use more complex and dynamic time series modeling techniques for use with this kind of longitudinal data that social media often provide us. When we look at the thoughts and prayers discourse, the, this, the top is the autocorrelation for the machine learning. The second is the autocorrelation for the hashtags. Thoughts and prayers have barely any autocorrelation. They come and they immediately disappear. It is ephemeral by definition. You say your thoughts and prayers and once you've said them, you've done your bit and you're done. Gun control, discourse is a little more cyclical and frankly has anniversaries typically around the one week anniversary of these events as people kind of re-emphasize the issue, at least to a degree. What's amazing is gun rights discourse is sustained and almost constant. And in the case of hashtags doesn't even decline after 40 days. What's more telling is when we use those individual factors of the number of victims, the number of children killed, the number of African-American victims, the race of the shooter, whether it was a public or school shooting, and we build regression models, specifically time series regressions, these are VAR models, uh, um, and we look at what is predicting thoughts and prayers or gun control discourse or gun rights discourse, or even just coverage of gun violence in the news, here's what we find. Certainly the number of victims explains attention, both thoughts and prayers, but attention to gun control, gun rights, general gun violence, but also more attention to gun control over gun rights, but only in progressive media, not in moderate or conservative media. The same pattern is true for the number of children killed. That as the number of children killed rises, so especially school-related shootings, this is most applicable towards, we see that exact same pattern of more thoughts and prayers, more calls for gun control, more defense of gun rights, more attention to gun violence in the news, and at least more attention to gun control over gun rights in progressive media. What's fascinating is, in terms of the number of African-American victims, 
as the number of African American victims rises, there's less attention in news media in general, but there's also fewer thoughts and prayers, fewer calls for gun control, fewer discussions about gun rights. Inversely, when the race of the shooter is white, we see those same things. When it's a minority shooter, we see more thoughts and prayers, more calls for gun control, more calls for defense of gun rights. But when it's a white shooter, we see less of each of those things and less attention in news media. Getting to the end of this, um, again, what we're seeing here is an asymmetric kind of nature of the polarized gun rights, gun policy discourse that may explain part of the resistance to policy change. We just, as I said, just saw uh, the first passage of a gun bill in 30 years in the US. It's frankly meager. It's more along the Republican talking points line than it is the Democratic ones. Um, gun rights discourse sustains longer. That group is not just highly visible, they're highly mobilized. It's not just the NRA, it's the online supporters of the NRA that remind Republican legislators constantly about their uh, visibility and their animation. A question that automatically emerges is, is that really human beings or is that bots? We actually tested for whether that was bots. It's not bots, it's real people who are that animated and that committed to gun rights. Um, we also found that not all lives are equally cherished. The volume and violence, the volume of violence and death of children matters more. Uh, the loss of black lives matters less. And not all attackers generated equal outrage. White shooters yield less social and news attention than black ones. Um, one of the questions we weren't able to ask here, but we do want to ask and answer is, do white shooters also spur more discourses about mental illness? Also, it's interesting that school shootings spur policy news in conservative media. Didn't highlight that, but that was the one finding we found for conservative media. And a lot of this is around hardening schools and arming teachers and, and making sure there's a good guy with the gun to confront the bad guy with the gun in the school setting. Well, we had one other question, and this we just, as I said, recently published in International Journal of Press Politics. And that is, so we have data for how these events shape both news and social media discourse. And it appears as if many of the same factors shape them simultaneously. But how do news and social influence one another, right? Is it a top-down influence? Is news shaping social media responses? Is it kind of agenda setting and framing effects of elites? Or is it bottom up? Is it social media shaping news content? Is the you know connective action a driver of news? Or is something else going on? So this is again the question that we just tried to answer uh, in, in international journal press politics. Again, Yuni Zhang uh, led this paper along with Sebastian Valenzuela of Chile and John Peavy House, who's been again a big part of a lot of these projects. He's the, the director of the political science department at Wisconsin. What we found in this most recent paper is, in fact, social media tends to drive news more than the other way around. That sustained attention to a topic on social media and especially certain kinds of social media discourses tend to motivate continued attention in news media. We also found that the political right tends to be more responsive and attentive and reactive to the political left, then the left is the political right, meaning the right may be counterpunching more than the political left. So again, this is after accounting for exogenous event features. So here, sympathy and gun control discourses, meaning the emphasis on gun rights or gun control over gun rights, were really driven much more by social media driving news than the other way around. Um, and then in terms of conservatives on Twitter, they were in conservative media, they reacted to progressives on Twitter without their progressive counterparts exhibiting a similar response. So the question here is, are they monitoring and countering what exactly is happening on the conservative side of the equation in terms of their reactivity compared to the liberal side? And is it restricted just to this issue because it's about mass shootings and it's more mobilizing to the left? So I'll stop here. Um, you know, 
across these two topics uh, with my preface in hand, I think there's a lot to be said for using these kinds of computational approaches for gaining new insights about the digital world. And I lied, I did have big data on the slide. Many available insights come from close analysis of system logs, some machine coding of posts. And we can look at all these kinds of digital traces that are left behind on social media, on mobile media, on RSS feeds for deep insights. And I think not just, you know, this is not about computational tools to show, wow, we can do this new technique. It's about really thorny and important questions that we're able to answer and tackle, whether they're about trying to help address the you know, issues of opioid addiction, or whether it's looking at the dynamics following you know, any kind of sustained issue discourse following mass shootings, right? And on the one hand, we're doing this with consent, on the other hand, with aggregation. And either way, we can provide a view into the dynamics embedded in, in social media use. And I would encourage those who are interested in these kinds of approaches to explore, you know, maybe it's about really looking at the micro level, gaining consent and looking at individual logs. Uh, uh, Teresa Correra, also a scholar in Chile, will sit down with people and do ethnographic work looking, having them describe uh, the phone, their phone and what apps they use and how they use their apps and have them do a digital ethnography where they open up their phone and talk about what's on their phone and how they use it. You know, again, that's much more specific, very similar to what we're doing, say, in addiction treatment versus the kind of aggregation uh, you saw in the work we're doing around mass shootings and social media and news media coverage. And so, as I said at the outset, again, this is really not just my work, but instead really the science of team science started with work with Joe Capella and Russ Newman in that annals volume, but also in my work with Dave Gustafson in chess. Um, and that goes back to 2014, 2015 for the projects I shared, but even earlier than that in both cases. Uh, but then, you know, again, Rachel Cornfield for a lot of the research specifically around addiction treatment and, and, and Yinny Zhang and, and Ji and Suk and Joe Lukito for a lot of the work around um, the mass shootings work. So I want to acknowledge them in particular. And then John P. V. House, my colleague at Wisconsin, has been a great partner in a lot of the methods work we've been doing in terms of time series analysis. So with that, I will stop. Um, my email is there if you'd like to contact me. If you would like to access any of those articles that were on the previous screen, uh, you can find, I think, almost all of them on my website, which is also link there, dshaw at journalism.wis.edu. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and open it up for Q&A. So thank you so much for your attention.